What is intermodalism and what does it have to do with the ports? Intermodalism is quite simply a system whereby standard sized cargo containers are moved seamlessly between different modes of transport. Intermodalism has advanced from the equivalent of the Stone Age to the Space Age in just under 65 years, commencing with the maiden voyage of the IDLX between the port of Newark, New Jersey and Houston, Texas in 1956 with 58 metal containers through to the call of the MSC Fabiola, one of the largest container vessels now serving the U.S.-Asia trade with a capacity of 12,500 TEUs at the port of Long Beach. Intermodalism has come of age. No longer can a shipping company, manufacturer, or retailer think of the ports and other modes of transportation in isolation. The respective modes are interconnected and are an integral part of the global supply chain. Volatile energy prices, congestion at key inland intermodal points such as Chicago, and the need to fill emptied containers returning to port, a process known as matchback, are all part of intermodalism. To give you an example of this matchback scenario, there's already lots of grain shipped in containers, but it's a volatile, unpredictable, and opportunistic business. The first defect is that grain is a backhaul movement in an empty container that came from Asia loaded with consumer goods or auto parts or something. The grain can never pay enough for a head haul movement in the container because when its price gets that high, then the bulk ships come out of the copper ore, rubber, bauxite, and iron ore trade and move grain instead. So the business is only feasible as long as there are containers going back empty. Example given, a really booming import economy. The second defect is that loaded containers that come from Asia don't go to places like Huron, Michigan or South Dakota or bigger Saskatchewan to disgorge their loads of auto parts and tennis shoes. They go to the big cities. That creates a major cost hurdle for the backhaul of grain in containers. Either the grain has to go to the city or the port and transload it into the container or the empty container has to go to the grain belt which means a lot of empty miles for the container and an intermodal facility at the grain loading point or the covered hopper loaded with the grain has to go to the big city or the port. <laughs> Are you confused yet? The third defect is the desire to keep the containers turning. The shipping lines which own the international containers do not like to have their containers wandering off into the wilderness because they need to keep them moving to keep their costs down. So most of the people who have tried to set up container restuff facilities any place other than a port or a big city have never gotten their business beyond the business plan stage.
I'm just closing. The fourth defect is the same problem on the Asian end. The manufacturing is clustered in a very narrow belt along the coasts and around the ports. The ships don't want their containers disappearing into the inland of China or Vietnam either. They might never come back. Plus, they want them reloaded with the profitable head haul consumer goods that same day, if possible. And at the ports, there isn't a lot of consumption of animal feed. The fifth defect is that most of the demand for container-sized lots of grain is in places like Vietnam and the Philippines, not in China where the ship lines don't really want to go because there isn't enough of a head haul demand. The big ships that move the trade to the United States don't go to the small ports where there's demand for the containerized grain, and a ship-to-ship -ship transload into the smaller feeder ships is expensive. Overall, the use of containers for grain transportation is a volatile business with nasty external dependencies. It's not a business you'd want today to make a big investment of fixed plant into because tomorrow your empty container supply might evaporate. Cargo arrival to North American coastlines is just the beginning of the port story. As retailers and manufacturers are discovering, in an e-commerce driven economy, the logistics of moving cargo from port to end consumer and then matching the empty containers with cargo en route back to the ports is the rest of the story, as the late Paul Harvey was famous for saying. Historically, trucking has been the preferred mode of transporting containerized goods inland from North American ports, and rail the means by which bulk commodities have flowed outbound. However, as diesel fuel prices remain volatile, shortages of truckers worsens and traffic congestion on highways slows the movements of goods, rail and air cargo are becoming more important and more reliable components of the intermodal story in North America. Retailers and manufacturers, confronted with increasing time pressures that compress with every technological advancement, have to balance both the cost and speed by which goods and materials flow. The primary consideration is no longer solely the cost of shipping, of equal or greater importance is the speed by which raw materials and finished goods move into the assembly process or consumers' hands. Clothiers can't put the seasons on hold while cargo remains held up at a choke point in the supply chain. If necessary, retailers incorporate air cargo into their logistics and intermodal equation, Columbus, Ohio and Memphis, Tennessee, to be exact. To have inventory on hand for the change of seasons, start back to school, or onset of the peak holiday shopping season.
As a result, retailers and manufacturers are remaking their entire supply chains. Distribution centers are appearing in what many might perceive to be off-the-beaten-path locations. Ashley Furniture, for example, frustrated with freight train delays in Chicago and seeing the export opportunities developing along the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast Coast, announced in quarter one of 2012 an expansion to North Carolina to meet global and intermodal logistic needs. Today, there is even the existence of a U.S. Intermodal Hubs database which identifies more than 3,000 points to designate facilities where freight shipments are handled by two or more modes of transportation. Retailers and manufacturers are studying these locations and spending almost as much capex on new distribution centers and logistics technology as they are for new store openings. How can one visualize and quantify this trend? The answer lies in an examination of the routes for the Class 1 North American railroads in conjunction with the designated Oscar load point where container shortages and surpluses are being tracked for the first time starting in second quarter 2012. These Oscar designations are the linkage between all that has to connect in logistics. First you have the ports and global trade is imports and exports. Then you have the inland population centers, the end consumers. Then you have the container availability. Where is the box to ship it? Labor and materials and banking and financial markets, the grease that lubricates trade and global commerce. Florida appears to be a large hole in the Oscar coverage. Florida's elected and business leaders 2012 adoption of a what is consumed in Florida must enter Florida by way of a Florida port campaign may expedite container tracking in Florida by Oscar. In the meantime, the Oscar for logistics goes to the designated MSAs for containerization intelligence. Agree or disagree, these Oscar markets have all the pieces required to meet today's definition of intermodalism and logistics. They encompass the port markets that process 75% of all North American TEU containers primary intersecting point for all the Class 1 railroads, including Dallas, Denver, Kansas City, Chicago, Minneapolis, Memphis, Norfolk, and New York City. Only Atlanta and Indianapolis are oddly omitted, and financially important MSAs located in all 12 of the Federal Reserve's districts except Boston and Philadelphia.
With three exceptions, Atlanta, Indianapolis, and Jacksonville, Oscar defines the epicenters of intermodalism and logistics in North America. These 21 markets, the Oscar 18 plus Atlanta, Indianapolis, and the Jacksonville editions that are missing from Oscar, will be leading the intermodal and logistics centers for North American retailers and manufacturers in the first post-Panamax decade, which is 2015 to 2025.
Go ahead, Mel. Uh... 